So today we are going to be talking about basically what all has been going on with this spring. Why has it been so weird compared to normal? And you may be asking, well, how has it been so weird? Well, considering the fact that we have had, well, so far, April, every single weekend was an outbreak. And two out of those three, two out of the three weekends that we counted as the big time outbreaks occurred in the South. Now, normally in this time of April, the South kind of loses its overall kind of a startup outbreak. So we don't see outbreaks start in the South. We see them kind of start over the plains and then make their way there. So the amount of tornadoes may be similar um, in the South, but really considering what all has been going on, it's weird that they're starting so far East. They're not starting in really that Central Texas. They're starting at the most Western part portions of it, maybe in the kind of that Eastern Texas, Louisiana portion. So I want to talk about some of the big stuff uh, put out by the SPC recently. So April 2020, by the SPC numbers, we had 78 SPC watches. 38 of them were severe thunderstorms, and then 40 of them were tornado watches. Two of them were the PDS, particularly dangerous situations. So that means that there definitely was a tornado on the ground. Um, two out of those times where they were counting it as big time storms. There were 227 mesoscale discussions. And those discussions are kind of what basically allow us to kind of go around and see, okay, what portion of this area are we looking at? What all can we expect from it? And a whole bunch of other stuff. But some of our big stuff was like the amount of days with a severe risk that we had. And normally, we see in May, uh, May is specifically the big time for this, we can see numbers in the 20s with 20 days with a severe risk. And a severe risk is anything marginal or higher. So in April, we saw 29 days with a severe risk. And there were 30 days in April. So this is crazy. So April 5th was the only day that had no severe risk, didn't have anything. Nothing was predicted for to happen or anything. So I think that's that that it's just crazy. I mean, only one day in April. And we keep seeing these getting earlier and earlier and earlier. We saw a small outbreak occur in January uh, down in the south, but we see these same places getting hit over and over again here in April. You know, I mean, the Easter one was the biggest one, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Our big thing was we have had 40 fatalities. It was the most in a in, mo in the month of April since, uh, or no, I guess it's the most in the month since 41 occurred in May 2013. We all remember back to El Reno and all those outbreaks that had occurred across parts of Oklahoma. So this was the most fatalities in a month since 2013 due to weather, and so that was 40. Uh, we had 32 from April 12th to 13th. We had two from the 19th to the 20th, and six from the 22nd to the 23rd. So really, that Easter weekend was a, was the biggest punch that we saw there. And we had 14 killer tornadoes, the fifth most on NOAA record. Uh, it was the most since the 43 had occurred in April of 2011. And our April tornado count just kind of give you the kind of a state of mind over why this year was so big in April. You may think, oh yeah, there weren't that many tornadoes. Well, we're going to go through kind of a little chart here of the April tornado counts. So we'll start out at 5, which is the least, and then go up to 1, which is the most, the worst situation. So our fifth spot was 2009. The prelim uh, preliminary count was 271. It ended up being 226 confirmed uh, tornadoes. And then the fourth was 2019, just last year. Uh, the prelim was uh, 271. It ended up being increased to 276. And then our third was 2006. At 322 on the prelim, ended up uh, going down to 244. And then second place was this year, 2020. The prelim preliminary count is 351. The actual count has yet to be determined. And the number one was 2011. 1,085 tornadoes that occurred in the preliminary track count, and actually 757 occurred. Which is, I mean, it's crazy. It's not like, oh yeah, it dropped 300 and it's like, it's not accurate. I mean, 757, when you have that many tornadoes across the country during that time, it's, I mean, just crazy to see. 
And so we pop down and look at the Outlook count. So this is in the month of April here in 2020. What outlooks occurred at what frequency? So we had 29 marginal risk uh, days. Uh, 20 of those days had a slight risk involved with them. 12 of them had an enhanced risk. Three had a moderate risk, and then zero had a high risk. So that's good. We're not seeing these super high risks nonstop. Uh, but our big thing was we did have three moderate risks, which, I mean, is kind of split up. It wasn't all towards the end of the month like what they sometimes are. But the big time uh, the big time storms that occurred early around Easter allowed for those moderate risks. The, another big thing was that we had 12 enhanced risks, which our big thing with that is that is about half of the month. It's a little less than half the month. And when you think about that, half of the month, so it's about every other day, we had an enhanced risk. So that is the potential for an outbreak to occur. The potential not actually occurring. So I think that that is crazy that all of that happened. And so looking at the numbers of April, uh, the Easter Sunday outbreak, there were 114 confirmed tornadoes. 32 tornado fatalities. Mississippi had 12. South Carolina had 9. Georgia had 8. And Tennessee had 3. It was the most fatalities on one day, which was 32, since March of 2012, which had 41. Uh, the most violent tornadoes, had there were three of them on a day since June 16th of 2014, and they had four. Um, it was the only fourth convective day with over 100 tornadoes. So we saw in 2011, there was a uh, 110. In 2020 here, we had 114. 1974, there was 143. And in 2011, there was 173. So our big thing is this was comparable to the 1974 super outbreak. So that is our big thing is, is that we are able to compare to such a huge event that was remembered for such a long time. And so I was looking through some stuff recently, and I was trying to figure out, okay, what all do we see normally? And, I mean, looking at these numbers, it's crazy. And looking at what the National Weather Service put out about the whole month, they really did nail that moderate risk zone. Where the moderate risk zone was was normally right where that bullseye was. It was always... It, always the tornadoes occurred somewhere within this uh, slight edge to that enhanced part. All of them had occurred in at least some portion that was within 50 miles of the enhanced zone. So and the big key with this is, you know, it's great that we're getting so accurate with these modeling uh, features, but our big thing is when you look at the kind of the map of overall of where all the tornadoes were reported, tracks of them, we saw these ones that went for hundreds of miles. We saw one that went from Texas clear up to Tennessee, uh, right where North Carolina's at. And that's the one that had affected so-so Mississippi, you know, the huge tornado that leveled some places, went into Georgia later and kind of moved a whole house out in the middle of the road, that famous image. And it's crazy that we see all of this because, I mean, it's still early in the year for that because that was our big key with there was that was um, the Easter Sunday one. So normally we would see if we see an outbreak like this at the end of April, but our key was this was at the beginning of April, um, or about halfway through. So it's something we have to keep watching in the future is are we seeing these uh, threats early on? So just talking about it, I mean, it is weird overall that we have seen more storms really affecting the south than the uh, plains. We haven't seen that much affecting the plains this year. Now, we did have that outbreak a little bit uh, earlier, a few weeks ago in Oklahoma and in Texas, but that was really the first one of the year from there. And so that kind of brings up the question of why, and we really the key is, is where the tropical moisture has been pulled up. We've seen just the right positioning all associated with these lows that are developing squall lines and in these squall lines we see the tail of them have individual supercells that aren't moving as quickly so they end up dragging behind and producing these massive storms with these huge tornado totals so that is our big key there is why the south has been that way we just seen more of this potential energy be kind of transferred into what can be used in the south now in kind of the plains in the oklahoma area we haven't seen as high of numbers uh because of where the energy has been it's all been producing and uh, kind of coming together either in eastern texas or in parts of louisiana mississippi so we are seeing that shift. So there's always a shift where the severe weather as it goes starts to go from the south and you can see it kind of training up towards parts of Oklahoma and Kansas and then the northern plains. Well, we are seeing that. Uh, the current outlook at the time of recording this is showing sometime in the next week or so, so the uh, whole full first week of May, uh, 
having that potential across parts of Oklahoma and even up into parts of Kansas. And so uh, we're starting to see that shift from the south, maybe towards focusing across the plains of where we're seeing kind of this genesis of super big uh, thunderstorms. So that's something that we could definitely see. And, I mean, it's something that's interesting. I mean, if we always have year that are a little bit of some flukes and stuff. But, I mean, we see these huge threats where we see enhanced travel for hundreds and hundreds of miles. And, I mean, pretty soon we're going to see some big-time storms. They're going to be producing tornadoes like crazy. great example was what happened out in Tulsa. I mean, there was a screenshot I have here of a radar scope run I had. Uh... There is so many reports and spotters that you can barely tell where the watches and warnings are. But our key is, I'm going to try to count these right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We had 11 th severe thunderstorm warnings in the same storm. This entire storm, it was at Squall Line that occurred uh, on 428. Well... I mean, there wasn't a single bit of the storm that wasn't covered in a severe thunderstorm warning. And let's not forget, there were four tornado warnings, plus the one up near Springfield, which was, like, super tall. Like, let's talk about that. that. Some of these storms are having such big hook echoes and signatures that the National Weather Service is just saying the entire thing is dangerous. We saw uh, kind of some generalized areas where we could see uh, a lot of rotation in the same system. I mean, we saw cells flash back to what happened in uh, kind of the Norman, or southeast of Norman, uh, down there, and what happened in uh, kind of Sulphur and McGill and some of those. Um, our big, uh, Mc McDill, my bad. Uh, but some of those, we see, we see these lines of the severe thunderstorm warnings, but our big key is what we saw we saw individual supercells all in a line that were bringing in their own energy. So that's what we see across kind of the central plains area. We've only seen one of those, and the best comparison of that was that uh, kind of a, that outbreak that occurred across Texas and Oklahoma, because we saw all of these storms all lined up, and they all had these wonderful-looking hooks on them. Problem is, they're going towards more dangerous areas, and kind of, you know, it's hilly in those areas, so you don't see it coming as early. So our big problem is is that, that we've had a lot of tornadoes in areas with low visibility. And so it, we want, I mean, if you, for research purposes, you want tornadoes in the middle of nowhere that aren't going to hit anything um, and they aren't going to cause any damage. But we've only seen these massive ones hitting areas. I mean, we saw ones hitting uh, pretty much big cities. We saw the one um, across parts of Dallas and then Nashville and those areas in the past where we can, you know, kind of go back through later and see how big these tornadoes really were. We've seen the ones in the nighttime that are really causing these massive amounts of damage. And that kind of brings up another point about uh, daytime convection. And something that's been different about all of these storms this year is that we're actually seeing a little bit more of a um, kind of a lack of reliability on daytime convection. We see storms get fired up, but our, all, most of these storms have had the worst threat between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. Before, so uh, just before sunset and just before sunrise, between those two times is when we've seen the most. So we see the storms gathering up energy, which means that we're seeing these massive tops building on these storms and then just absolutely ruthless kind of downbursts and then energy flowing into the, these storms. So, I mean, it's something that we'll have to watch and see if that is a trend that's going to form over the whole year. Because when we see these storms that gather energy the whole day and they put them all out overnight, that's the worst case scenario. But we have seen, overall, some really nice looking squall lines. And so that's a key. I mean, squall lines have damaging winds and everything. But our kind of a big uh, bonus is that you can kind of tell when there's going to be a squall line, you can prepare out ahead of the storms that there could be some embedded rotations in there. And these pop-up supercells that gain a hook really quickly, it's hard to predict where those are going to be at. So definitely overall, it's been a very severe year already, and we're just getting into May. And May is going to be, we'll look at an outlook here within the next week um, and talk about it on our forecast, and then we might make a podcast about it. But our big keys are... Um, really what's occurring in the future models. Are the future models supporting what's, you know, really going on in live data? So, you know, if we have one model that disagrees and, that, and all of our models agree most of the time on a general area that you can average, then that could help somebody. But if we have models that are running all over the place on their own, then that's not going to do us any good. 
So we're going to have to see how the models are running this year. So far, they've been pretty good. Um, I've been tracking some of the RAPs and uh, Namconuses and some of those other ones. Each triple R has been very severe this year so far. It's been accurate in the south, but in the plains, it was not accurate um, to its full extent that it was in the south. So a few keys if you're thinking about looking and forecasting on your own this year. I would not really focus on the HRRR as the 100% truth. I would focus on the HRRR for storm convection, and then past that, that's it. Its tornado threat has always been extreme, but our big key is with the uh, HRRR is watching, uh, you know, where those storms are developing. Then from there, you can switch to a different model and checking out. Uh, I, personally, the Namconus has been really good with storm tracking, and then I've been using a combination of other models to show kind of tornado threat. So, I mean, using all of those and just kind of using the average is the best way for the most accurate results. And I'm just flipping through Twitter right now, and I forgot to mention the Florida kind of tornado, mini tornado outbreak that occurred. And there was multiple tornadoes in central Florida, and there was a slight risk today or today, that day, with it. We saw ones that have produced over uh, Ocala and really gone towards parts of uh, Deltona and east of Orlando. We saw these massive hooks get put on these storms, and then we even saw this one that had developed into a massive water spout just off the coast of Daytona Beach, and it developed the hook just at the right time, just after it had gone off the shore, and then that storm later on produced water spouts out over the ocean. But we saw these huge storms that were hitting big things, like there was a possible tornado that hit Kennedy Space Center. And there were these ones that were crossing the road, and we just saw people driving along. And these things aren't very wide. They're maybe 20 to 50 yards wide, and they can have winds of 200 miles per hour. You may be thinking, that's not a big tornado. How can it be that damaging? Well, all of our tornadoes this year that we've seen have been multi-vortex, the ones that we've seen on video at least. And these multi-vortex tornadoes, the whole circulation could be going 150 mile per hour, let's just say, but those little vortices on the inside, those tendrils that go around the outside of it, each one of those has their own. So when you combine that, theoretically, we have 500 mile per hour winds that can be occurring in an EF3 tornado, but really there's no way to safely gather that data. So we're, that's why they're trying to figure out ways that they, you can safely do it. Um, one thing that has been wonderful this year has been the velocity models. Um, they have been very well uh, put together. And we've seen on velocity all of these tornadoes get shown, and especially on the correlation coefficient, we see these wonderful uh really those blue dots. And in some storms you don't see this. There's a tornado on the ground, but it's not really allowing the radar to see what debris it's getting picked up with it. Sometimes you wonder if it's actually scanning right, and this year has been a good show that all the which radars and which uh, models are showing good sized velocities and debris balls and stuff. It's been a very good year for kind of that test of a radar. And we have seen some two mile wide tornadoes on the correlation coefficient. Uh, the one that hit so-so, I was checking that one out, it was 2.3 miles uh, my bad, 2.4 miles actually, 2.4 miles and a debris ball. And, I mean, you, that's just debris getting thrown aloft, but later on was found to almost have almost be a 2 mile wide tornado. I think it was a 2.1 if I heard that right. I could be wrong about that, but our big, kind of a big situation is we are seeing these 2 mile wide tornadoes and we are just now ramping up. And I have video after video of these kind of snapshots of looking at radar, and you can just tell what the hooks are, which is very nice this year. But our big, kind of a big congratulations are to the forecasters, because they have gotten this accurate a whole bunch. So as we close here, coming up on 20 minutes, our kind of a big thanks is to the forecasters who are doing all of this, because they are working hard and seeing where all this stuff is at. But a big kind of a note is pay attention to where that enhances at, because as we see, there is always a tornado associated with that enhanced if there's an outbreak. If there's an outbreak, it's we don't see them not in or around at least 50 miles of the enhanced. So it is not a time if you see enhanced to think, oh, it could be higher. That is way high enough. We've seen tornadoes in the slight that are really big. So really, if you see a slight threat for your area, I prepare. Just think of where your stuff's at, and then if that gets bumped up to an enhanced or higher, I would prepare and just be thinking in my mind that there could be one near us. 
So on the last note, always read the discussions also. They will give you a great amount of information, and they are a good key to understanding kind of that weather jargon, but overall understanding what people are talking about when they talk about these systems moving through. Because it can help you out a lot if you can go online and kind of do your own research on it and prepare and study through forecasting. You can kind of tell what's going to be happening in your own backyard. So, I mean, looking back at the Easter outbreak, so many tornadoes, there were five lists of just tornadoes that that the National Weather Service put together, and so many counties and cities affected, so many lives changed, especially during this pandemic. It is, it's definitely a different year overall, because you have to worry about storm chasing with the COVID-19 era occurring, and, you know, with these many tornadoes occurring, uh, there are a lot of people out. And with a lot of people home, it's been a good thing this year because with these many tornadoes in these populated areas, people are home to hear about uh, the warnings and they are able to get to shelter or they are are already in there. So it is a good thing overall. Uh, And just kind of an interesting fact out of the NWS Eastern region to kind of close this out. The Eastern outbreak, the combined total length of the tornado paths was 903.28 miles. So if you were to link individual tornado distances and link them all together, you could go 903 miles. That is almost a 1,000 miles. That is crazy. So it's definitely going to be an active year. We'll talk about that in the next episode. But our big thing is kind of covering our basis on being prepared and focusing on, you know, what could occur and just being weather ready. So thank you for listening, and we hope to see you in the next podcast. And remember to stay safe and be healthy out there during this pandemic. Hope you have a good day, and thank you again.